Welcome back everyone. Uh, in this lecture, I will begin the theory of abstract root systems. So, ultimately we would like to classify all finite root systems. So, let us first uh, uh, recall the definition of uh, this root system. So, we already saw that uh, this root system actually naturally comes from uh, the theory of semi-simple Lie algebras. Anyway, we will just uh, first write down all the important properties and then make the definition. So, we will actually fix some notations. We denote E by the Euclidean space. So, this is uh, Euclidean space. So, that means E is uh, finite dimensional real vector space equipped with uh, an inner product equipped with an inner product. So, that is actually positive definite uh, bilinear form. So, this inner product we just uh, denote it by just uh, uh, bracket comma bracket. So, because this is a positive uh, definite bilinear form, if we take any x in E uh, and then we have uh, this uh, inner product x x is 0 if and only if x is 0. And uh, we know that uh, for uh, any x in E, uh, the inner product x x must be always greater than or equal to 0. So, these two conditions uh, must be true. So, in particularly we can use all the information that we know uh, about Euclidean geometry. Okay? So, that is something uh, uh, we will be repeatedly using. So, what is special about uh, working in the Euclidean space? Uh, so, now uh, uh, let us recall uh, the formula that actually uh, we got between two roots. Okay? If we take alpha and beta, so these two are roots. So, then we saw that beta minus beta of h alpha. So, or otherwise it is in terms of the inner product, it is actually exactly beta minus twice beta alpha divided by alpha alpha alpha. So, we saw that for alpha beta roots, beta minus this twice beta alpha divided by alpha alpha alpha, this also must be a root. So, this formula in some sense actually possesses lots of information about uh, these roots. So, let us closely look at this formula and then see uh, what this formula actually tells uh, uh, in terms of the transformations. So, if we take uh, this gamma inside capital E and then this alpha inside phi, so then we can define this following map. So, this following map which we denoted by s gamma of alpha sorry s alpha of gamma. So, what is this uh, map s alpha of gamma? So, that is given by this formula gamma minus twice gamma of alpha divided by alpha alpha alpha. So, now look at this formula. So, this formula definitely defines uh, linear transformations on uh, this capital E. So, it is not hard to see this is indeed actually a reflection with respect to alpha. So, what I mean by reflection? So, you can see that this is definitely uh, reflects the hyperplane that is perpendicular to this alpha. So, let us denote P alpha by those x in E such that uh, this x comma alpha is 0. So, that means uh, this is a plane that is perpendicular to this alpha. So, the hyperplane that is perpendicular to to alpha. So, now what happens if you look at this formula star? So, then uh, you can see that uh, easily that S alpha of gamma. So, that will be gamma if gamma actually comes from this P alpha because this gamma alpha, this inner product will be 0. So, that means S alpha gamma will be gamma. So, that means all the points that are on this plane, so which is uh, P alpha, so those are all fixed. Now, this alpha is actually going to be a vector which is uh, perpendicular to, 
to this p alpha. So, you can see that uh, this s alpha of alpha. So, if you substitute in the formula, uh, you can see that that you get minus alpha. So, because when you do this reflection with respect to this p alpha, so this alpha must be mapped to minus alpha. So, s alpha of alpha you can see from the formula. So, this alpha minus twice alpha comma alpha divided by alpha alpha comma alpha. So, that means this is going to give us minus alpha. So, that means you can see that the reflection with respect to this hyperplane p alpha uniquely determined by, by these two formulas. So, since s alpha is actually uh, that is given in this star satisfy these conditions. So, that means this s alpha must be a reflection with respect to this p alpha. So, s alpha this is the reflection. So, with respect to the hyperplane p alpha. So, in order to actually give this p alpha it is enough to say what is alpha. So, note that uh, scaling this alpha will not change the reflection. So, s alpha will be same as s of c alpha for all c coming from real numbers which is not 0. Okay. So, so what this means? This means, so the if we take alpha beta in phi, so then if we look at s alpha of beta which is the reflection defined using alpha and then that acts on this beta that must be inside phi. So, this is an important condition. So, that tells that uh, these reflections play a vital role in the theory of this root system. Okay. So, here we have this reflection and we observe that s alpha must be equal to s c alpha. So, now we will actually define uh, so what is the root system using these reflections. So, here is the definition which is motivated from the set of roots that we have seen from uh, the theory of semi simple Lie algebras. But again like uh, we just take the properties uh, that are satisfied and then we will see that those properties more or less determines the root system and as well as the corresponding uh, semi simple Lie algebras. Okay. So, what are all those properties which is already I listed, but anyway let me recall. So, we say a subset phi of E is actually a root system. First of all we take it to be finite subset, okay. a subset phi of E. It is said to be a root system. So, it must satisfy the following conditions. If it satisfies the following condition, what are those conditions? First condition is phi must be finite and 0 is not in phi and the span of phi over real that must be capital E. So, because this is sitting inside the equivalent space, it is a spanning set that is what it says. The second condition, if we take alpha, so then the only multiple of alpha must be plus or minus alpha. If alpha is in phi, so then the only multiple of alpha that are in phi are plus or minus alpha. The third condition, so this this is just says that if uh, alpha is in phi and c alpha is in phi, then that should imply c must be plus or minus 1. The third condition which is about uh, this reflection, if alpha and beta is in phi, so then what we do? We take this s alpha of beta which is the reflection uh, with respect to alpha applied on beta. So, which is by definition beta minus twice beta alpha divided by alpha alpha alpha. So, this is the algebraic formula for the reflection. So, then this must be again a root inside phi. The fourth condition, so this is called crystallographic condition. So, which is actually motivated from uh, the root system that pops up from this uh, uh, semi simple Lie algebras. So, what is this crystallographic condition? So, that is actually about the integrality of this Carton numbers. 
So, if alpha beta is in phi, so then this number that we are interested in, so this 2 uh, beta alpha divided by alpha alpha, so that must be an integer. So, this twice beta alpha divided by alpha alpha, this must be integer. So, these numbers will be called Cartan numbers or integers. Okay. So, so because the, this notation is going to be again, again and again uh, uh, used. So, we just uh, simplify this as uh, this angled beta comma alpha. So, the angle beta comma alpha defined to be this Cartan number uh, twice beta alpha divided by alpha alpha. So, this is the definition of this angle beta gamma alpha. So, in general if we actually uh, assume this uh, uh, condition the only multiple of alpha that are in phi are nothing but plus or minus alpha. So, this condition is actually naturally motivated from uh, for the roots that are coming from semi similar algebra. So, this condition will be called reduced condition. Okay. In literature, uh, we can see that root system actually pop up in many places, many different places in Lie theory. For example, uh, it is also actually comes naturally from uh, the theory of finite reflection groups and not only that, there are other places like affine Lie algebras and so on. This, uh, uh, root system naturally pop up. So, there we have to we have to consider somewhat more general setting. Okay. If this condition reduce uh, uh, second condition is actually called what is called reduced root system. So, in literature the condition 2 will be dropped that will be called non reduced root system. Of course, in this course uh, we will not consider non reduced root system. And of course, this condition 4 that is called crystallographic condition which is again naturally motivated from uh, the roots that we come that we come across to, from the semi simple Lie algebras. But again like I said uh, when we consider root system that comes from finite reflection groups this crystallographic condition uh, would not be satisfied. So, in that case we just consider root system without this 4. But anyway in this course whenever we say root system we always mean the root system that satisfy this condition 1 to 4. So, in literature it is called crystallographic reduced root system, but uh, we will not get confused we just call this as root system. So, now you can see that once we have defined root system then there is a natural group that is actually associated with the root system. So, that is generated by all the reflections that comes from this alpha in phi. Okay. So, we denote this w or the w of phi. So, once the phi is understood we just take it to be w. So, that is going to be the subgroup of g l of e which is generated by all this reflection s alpha where alpha coming from phi. So, this is uh, clearly subgroup of uh, g l of e which is a uh, set of all invertible transformations, invertible linear transformations from e on to e. Okay. So, now it is uh, easy exercise to check I will leave it to you to check that S alpha inverse is actually S alpha. So, that means S alpha is an involution inside G L of E. So, S alpha in particularly inside G L of E. So, we can talk about this uh, W which is uh, subgroup generated by all the reflection that comes from this uh, set of roots phi. So, this W is actually called the while group. This is the while group of phi. So, if we go back to the condition 3, so what this condition 3 says? So, if we take any reflection S alpha, then S alpha of phi must be equal to phi. So, that is what condition 3 says. So, the root condition R3 implies that, that S alpha of phi 
is actually subset of phi. Since S alpha is invertible, this is actually going to give us because phi is finite, S alpha phi must be equal to phi. Okay. So, now it is clear that uh, W also maps phi to phi. So, any element of W. So, W of phi maps phi into phi for all W and W as W is generated by S alpha alpha is in phi and for generators we have this condition. So, that means uh, W naturally acts W naturally acts on this phi. So, now let us look at this action. So, what is the meaning of naturally acts? So, that means W permutes all the elements of phi. Okay. So, W permutes all the elements of phi. So, in particularly we have a natural map let us call it pi from W to this S of phi. So, this is the symmetric group on phi, symmetric group on phi. So, that means uh, all bijective maps from phi to phi. So, the map is defined to be you take W and then send it to, so W just permutes phi to phi. So, then you just send it to that permutation W of phi. Okay. Note that uh, this map is actually is uh, injective map. So, I will leave it to you to check this is a group homomorphism. So, that is not uh, very hard to check. So, pi is a group homomorphism. So, that follows from the fact that W acts on phi. So, now what kind of group homomorphism it is? You can see that since phi spans entire space capital E, this pi must be injective map. Okay. So, pi, pi is injective since span of phi is equal to identity. So, let us prove this fact. So, this is easy to prove. Suppose W fixes all alpha for all alpha in phi. So, that means W is in the kernel of pi. So, then that implies W actually fixes all the span of phi. So, W x will be x for all x inside span of phi, but the thing is span of phi is capital E. So, that implies W is actually identity on E. So, that forces that uh, this pi is injective. So, that means W is embedded inside embedded inside this S phi. So, since S phi is finite group, so that forces that W is also a finite group. So, we have defined this W in a way like uh, abstract group generated by these reflections S alpha alpha coming from phi. So, a priori it may not be finite group, but we proved that since span of phi is E. So, this must be actually a finite group. So, now let us closely understand uh, more about uh, this group. So, for that uh, purpose we need to actually uh, recall uh, some of the interesting uh, facts about uh, some uh, element of GL of E that acts on this capital E which leaves phi invariance. So, let us make uh, this uh, uh, important uh, general remark, so which I will call it lemma, uh, and then using that we will understand the action of W more on capital phi. So the lemma one, what it says, so you start with phi being a finite set which spans C. For example, you can take it to be a root system, not a problem. So let phi be a finite set that spans capital E. So, now what we do? We take all the reflections that comes from this elements of phi. We assume that uh, this phi is invariant under those reflections. Suppose S alpha phi is equal to phi for all alpha in phi. So, let us assume this. So, then 
uh, if we have this uh, uh, some element sigma which is inside your GL of phi. So, let us say this actually leaves your phi invariant phi invariant. So, that means sigma of phi is equal to phi. And also assume that it fixes a hyperplane. So, it fixes point wise a hyperplane. So, that hyperplane let us call it uh, capital P of E and uh, assume that this also sends some non-zero alpha in phi to its negative. So, it also sends some non-zero alpha in phi to its negative. So, then we prove that this sigma must be S alpha for some that, some that particular alpha in phi and uh, this uh, P also the hyperplane also must be equal to P alpha. Okay. So, you may wonder actually why uh, such a lemma that we need. So, we will see many applications of this lemma later. For example, one of the applications uh, using this lemma we can understand uh, uh, all the reflections that are in W. Okay. For example, if you start with the reflection sigma inside your W, uh, then uh, since W leaves phi invariant, so that sigma satisfies all the properties of this lemma. So, because uh, so in particularly uh, one can actually try to prove uh, that sigma is actually S alpha for some alpha in phi. So, that is indeed uh, kind of says that. So, S alphas are the only reflections that are in W. Okay, we will actually uh, come to that uh, conclusion later, but anyway. So, this is about uh, some sigma that is acting on phi that fixes a hyperplane P and sends some alpha to its negative then that sigma what we can say is that sigma that sigma must be S alpha that is what we are saying. So, how do we prove such statement? So, let us try to see. So, to prove this statement uh, sigma equal to S alpha it is enough to prove that uh, sigma S alpha is actually identity. So, for that purpose we just take tau to be sigma S alpha note that this is same as sigma of S alpha inverse because S alpha is involution. So, now uh, since S alpha sigma both leaves phi invariant you can see that tau of phi is also phi. So, that is very clear. So, now if you compute what is tau of alpha. So, that is going to be sigma S alpha of alpha which is going to be sigma of minus alpha since sigma maps alpha to minus alpha. So, it is going to be uh, plus alpha. So, that means tau of alpha is equal to alpha. So, tau leaves alpha invariant. So, now uh, if we take this capital E you can see that this capital E can be written as P direct sum R alpha because sigma fixes all the elements of P and sigma maps alpha to minus alpha. So, that means elements of P and R alpha they are all linearly independent. So, that makes it E equal to P direct sum R alpha. So, similarly you can also see that uh, P alpha and alpha they must be linearly independent. So, then that makes P alpha direct sum R alpha is also capital E. So, in particularly if we consider this space capital V which is nothing but E modulo R alpha. So, then we can make uh, this sigma as well as S alpha to act on this capital V. Uh, since sigma of alpha is minus alpha and then uh, S alpha of alpha is also minus alpha. So, that actually allows us to uh, make the sigma and S alpha to act on this capital V. So, note that sigma and S alpha act on this capital V. So, let us compute how it acts. So, 
uh, indeed we want to compute the action of tau on this V. Okay. So, this implies so tau act on this capital V. Note that tau of alpha is already alpha. So, because tau of alpha is alpha, so tau naturally act on capital V. So, we will just use this information and then compute how tau acts on this capital V. So, for that purpose let some V bar inside capital V. So, then you can write this V bar as V plus R alpha for some V in your uh, capital E. So, now since capital E is nothing but uh, uh, P plus R alpha. So, you can write this V as some elements from P and then some C times alpha where P is coming from capital P and C is coming from R. So, that you can see that this is exactly equal to V bar equal to P plus R alpha. Similarly, this V is also coming from capital E which is P alpha plus R alpha. So, then you can already write this V as some P alpha plus some D alpha where P alpha coming from capital P alpha, D coming from this R. So, then you can see that this also can be written as P alpha plus R, R alpha. So, now let us compute what happens if we apply S alpha of V bar. So, S alpha of V bar will be exactly equal to S alpha of P alpha plus R alpha because we know the action of S alpha on P alpha so that is why we just use the second representative. So, then that says S alpha P alpha must be P alpha because S alpha fixes all the elements in capital P. So, then we get S alpha V bar equal to P alpha plus R alpha. So, that means this is exactly equal to V bar. So, similarly uh, we can see that if we take tau of V bar which will be sigma of S alpha of V bar. So, then this becomes sigma of V bar. What is sigma of V bar? We can use this first representative of V bar. So, then it can we can see that sigma of V bar is nothing but sigma P R alpha. So, that means sigma P is P. So, then this, this fixes P R alpha which is exactly V bar. So, this proves that tau fixes each element inside this capital V which is E modulo R alpha and it also fixes alpha. So, that means tau has only one as eigenvalue. So, the only eigenvalue of tau is 1. Of course, counted with multiplicity it will be dimension of E. So, then it means the characteristic polynomial of the characteristic polynomial of tau must be x minus 1 power dimension of E. So, now this implies that the minimal polynomial of tau must be x minus 1 power r for some r that is at most dimension e. Okay. So, one hand we get this. On the other hand we can see that this tau actually fixes uh, sorry leaves phi invariant. So, that but phi actually spans this capital E okay, because sigma leaves phi invariant S alpha also leaves phi invariant. So, that makes this tau to leave this phi invariant and span of this phi is actually capital E. So, these two things are given. So, from that we can actually again compute the action of tau in particularly the minimal polynomial of tau. So, let us take some beta in phi and then observe that this beta, tau beta, tau square beta and so on this cannot be all of them distinct okay, because all these are elements of capital phi and capital phi is finite. So, that forces that there exists some power i and j such that this tau power i beta must be equal to tau power j beta. So, then you can actually assume to be i greater than or equal to j. 
So, then you can see that tau power i minus j beta must be equal to beta. And since phi is finite, so this forces that uh, there exists some large k such that tau power k beta is beta for all beta in phi. And since phi actually spans, so span of phi is equal to capital E, so that forces that tau power k is identity on capital E. So, this means the minimal polynomial of tau must divide must divide tau power k sorry x power k minus 1 x power k minus 1. But we have already observed that the minimal polynomial of tau already divides x power minus 1 power dimension e. So, that means the minimal polynomial of minimal polynomial of tau must divide both x power minus 1 power dimension e and x power k minus 1. But you can see that they are actually the only polynomial that divides both of them is nothing but x minus 1. So, that forces that the minimal polynomial of tau is dividing divides x minus 1. Okay. So, if so that means so the minimal polynomial actually should be non trivial polynomial. So, it is non constant polynomial. So, that makes it actually the minimal polynomial of tau is equal to x minus 1. So, that forces that tau must be identity on E. So, that is what we wanted to prove because tau is nothing but sigma s alpha. So, that forces that sigma equal to s alpha. Now, since sigma is s alpha and sigma fixes this capital P and s alpha fixes this capital P alpha. So, that forces that those two hyperplanes P and P alpha must be same. So, this actually ends the proof of this lemma. So, this lemma again will be very uh, crucial and it will be used again and again later in order to understand isomorphism between phi or automorphism between phi and so on. So, what it says let me repeat you start with a finite set that spans E for example, you can take phi to be a, a finite root system. So, suppose if you assume that uh, S alpha phi is phi uh, for all alpha in phi and there is a sigma in G L of E that leaves phi invariant that fixes point wise a hyperplane P of E and sends some non-zero alpha in phi to its negative. So, then we can conclude that sigma must be equal to S alpha and, and in particularly P equal to P alpha. Okay. So, we will see uh, some consequence of uh, uh, this result later. Uh, so, I will actually uh, stop now because we are running out of time. Uh, I will continue with uh, more properties of root system in the next class. So, in particularly I will actually classify uh, the rank 2 and rank 1 root systems uh, which will actually serve uh, good examples of uh, root systems. Okay, I will stop here. Thanks.